All right. Well, thanks very very much for joining us uh, today, folks. Uh, this is um, this event's a partnership with uh, APA Illinois Chicago Metro Section, uh, as well as Transport Chicago. Uh, I'm Brandon Nolan, I'm with House of Levine. I'm the director of uh, APA CMS. Um, this is, I want to say, the fourth, maybe the fifth time we've kind of done a joint um, kind of presentation along with Transport Chicago. Uh, as you know, and Jason will speak to you in a minute. Great organization um, and. and uh, pulls together a lot of transportation related kind of planning discussions uh, in, the, in the area. So it's a natural partnership for us. Um, I just want to give a quick plug for APA Illinois. Um, I know I'm speaking to a lot of probably non members, kind of the transportation folks that don't necessarily uh, see them as part of the chapter. So we do have a, a chapter only membership option. So please check it out. Uh, go to our website. Uh, it's down the bottom there. Um, but ILAP.org has got information. Um, and, and that's where we plan a lot of events. A lot of them do end up being around transportation and infrastructure related projects, but we've had a lot of great discussions that we happen about once a month uh, that we're doing virtually these days. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to Jason. I just want to say thanks again for everyone's time and for joining us today. Hi, uh, thanks for that introduction, Brandon. My name is Jason Wald, and I am the president of this year's Transport Chicago Steering Committee. Uh, thanks again for joining us this Wednesday afternoon. Before I introduce the session today, I did just want to let everyone here know about Transport Chicago. We are a one-day volunteer-run transportation conference. This year's conference will be our 36th annual and our second virtual conference. Past speakers have included everyone from USDOT deputy secretaries to heads of transit agencies across the country and numerous local leaders, activists, experts, and practitioners. If you're interested in more information, please feel free to visit our website at www.transportchicago.org and to join our mailing list um, to help stay up to date. Um, with that, I'll introduce uh, today's programming. It's uh, from pilot to permanent, how transportation agencies leverage rapid deployment, to rapid deployment projects to innovate. Um, with limited project funding, high infrastructure capital costs, and bureaucratic red tape, transportation agencies are using rapid deployment projects to overcome objections, test innovative solutions, and refine designs before they become permanent. These pilots allow agencies to move more quickly and in a more responsive manner than would normally be permitted with traditional design bid build projects. Join us today to hear from planners from Oakland, California, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Atlanta, Georgia, and Washington, DC, who will all share their experiences in implementing rapid bus lanes, slow streets, active streets, tactical urbanism, and placemaking. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Sarah to introduce our speakers. Thanks very much, Jason. Um, I'm very pleased to present our uh, five speakers today and thank them in advance for their time, both in putting together their presentations and sharing what their expertise with us today. Um, our first speaker will be Noelle Pondanchik, she, her, hers. She's a transportation planner at Oakland, California's Department of Transportation, i.e. OCDOT, in their bicycle and pedestrian program. She's also the co-chair of the OCDOT racial equity team, working to reduce internal and external racial disparities for the department. She leads the implementation of the 2017 adopted Oakland pedestrian plan, Oakland Walks, acts as a staff liaison for Oakland's Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission and manages the Paint the Town program, which facilitates mural paintings on streets by community members across the city. For the past year, she's worked on Oakland's Slow Streets and Essential Places program, and will share with, her, share with us her lessons learned from that program. Kate Reardon, she, her, hers, is a transportation planner with the City of Milwaukee Department of Public Works. She manages the city's dockless scooter pilot study, the bike, spare, bike share expansion project, and complete streets implementation, among many other responsibilities. Prior to this role, Kate was the active living program manager for Health by Design, an Indianapolis-based nonprofit, and the only ever active transportation planner for the city of Fort Wayne, Indiana. She has a master's of urban planning from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Bette Malloy is an urban planner and designer at the Atlanta City Studio. As a designer, Bette works to support studios, the studio's mission of creating an exceptional public realm for all Atlantans. Prior to joining the studio in 2018, Bette completed her degree in landscape architecture at West Virginia University and worked as a designer for both private companies and nonprofit organizations in Atlanta. In her spare time, Bette enjoys biking around the city and walking in nature. 
Yvette is joined by Sonia Sequera, who is the Community Engagement Manager for the Office of Design, also in Atlanta's Department of City Planning. She works on communicating the work of the, to the residents. You can follow along at, at ATL City Studio or at ATL Planning. And she partners with external organizations to expand the reach and highlight the impact of the work of the department. She has her Master of Public Health and a Master of Social Work from Washington University in St. Louis and is passionate about the intersection of city design, equity, and well being. Our last panelist is Johannes Benehoff, a transportation planner with the Washington, D.C. District Department of Transportation, DDOT. His primary responsibilities are operations and planning coordination with the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, Transit Authority or WAMADA. Um, and project development and management of bus priority projects and supporting transit delivery in the district. Johannes holds a Master of Community Planning from the University of Maryland. Welcome all, and I'm gonna turn it over to Noelle for her to uh, kick us off. Great, thank you so much. Thanks Sarah and thanks everyone for having me today. Um, can you hear me okay? gonna work on we hear you. sharing my awesome and how about that do you see do you see my slides yes awesome cool all right so thanks everyone for having me um like Sarah said I'm I'm from Oakland California um coming from Oakland California I'm one of Oak Dot uh, transportation planners and this morning I'm going to be talking about our slow streets and essential places program. Um, so our program was rolled out very quickly um, in response to COVID-19 and to create more space for socially distant activity as places like parks and trails were crowding. It was launched actually over a year ago, which is which is wild to me now in April 11th, 2020. Um, and its initial goal was to create more space for comfortable, physically distant walking, wheelchair rolling, jogging, biking, scootering, rollerblading, whatever you want, all across the city by closing streets to through traffic um, using traffic cones, signage, barriers, like you can see in the photo on the left. Um, and rerouting people using Google and Apple Maps. And I do want to mention there is never an enforcement component of the program. It's really about encouraging people to slow down. And so while those were the initial goals of the program, it was later expanded to include slow streets, essential places. Um, that's a part of the program. I'm really proud of how our community involvement led to that change in the program. Um, in particular, when we heard that Slow Streets wasn't meeting the needs of many Oaklanders who didn't feel safe or comfortable or have time or didn't want to recreate in the streets and, and really wanted us to focus on traffic safety and slowing speeding on major arterials, we came up with the Slow Streets Essential Places branch of the program. Those are a mix of permanent and temporary traffic safety improvements like signage, daylighting, pedestrian refuges like you see in the photo, bulbouts or setting pedestrian signals to recall to enable safer access for residents and, and safer access for residents to their essential services in their neighborhood. And we defined essential services as grocery stores, food distribution sites in public facilities like schools or libraries and COVID-19 testing sites that overlaid. So any of those that overlaid with our high injury network where we have the most fatal, fatal and severe injuries on our streets. And we prioritize these locations based off of our geographic equity toolbox. Um, so prioritize using factors like race and income. So that was a little introduction on what it is. Um, and I'm gonna start off by talking about phase one of the program, um, the rollout. So starting from our first installation in April, 2020, to July 10th, 2020, the last installation for the time being. Um, please excuse the cat. Um, from April to July, we installed 21 miles of slow streets on 21 corridors and 15 different essential places locations. And you can kind of see our timeline where we started rolling out more corridors in the beginning and later moved to 
more essential places. And here's just a map of Oakland where the slow streets are and the dots are the slow streets essential places. And they're distributed pretty much throughout the city. Um, and then this is just a high level roll up of what was installed. We also deactivated push buttons on slow streets corridors to be more pedestrian friendly and to avoid needing to touch like high touch surfaces. Um, and then we added these stickers to let people know. Although we didn't completely deactivate the signal, um, so you, the signal would still work if you had pressed it. Um, okay, so I just want to give a huge shout out to all those who've been really instrumental in this effort. It's, it was a huge interagency coordination effort. We had a ton of help from the mayor's office, and we really, really could not have done it without our advocacy community. Um, it was our volunteers that made this program a success. Since the beginning, without us asking, they went out to place the signs, to stand up barricades that fell over. They alerted 311 when barricades were missing. They phone banked for our survey. They helped with our evaluation efforts, and they were just like really, really critical to the whole thing. Um, so in terms of how we've been engaging, we had quite a few different avenues for us to hear from people. We had an existing contract with a partner, with partner transportation nonprofit organizations in East Oakland, East Oakland, um, where many of our low income residents and residents of color live. Um, and then we also had some other community based organizations that we were in conversation with in Chinatown as well as some citywide transportation focused community based organizations and we used these um, relationships to kind of get feedback on the program and to help spread the word to to um, their their different communities their different communications um, and what kind of feedback did we get so honestly it was a very polarizing program. Um, we had an online survey that received over a thousand responses um, and there's a publicly accessible dashboard and I think that link you can find it from our web page. Um, and so while our online survey did show that most people were in favor of the program, it also showed that those who filled out the survey tended to be whiter, wealthier, and come from North Oakland, one of our higher income neighborhoods than the general Oakland population. And support for the program was lower for the Black, Indigenous, people of color, low-income people, and people living in deep, Oakland, deep East Oakland who did take the survey. Um, so a lot of people love the program. We got a ton of support from our transportation advocates in our city and across the country. And we heard that slow streets made their neighborhood feel safer and more enjoyable. But we also heard um, from many of our lower income and deep East Oakland community members that the program wasn't addressing their needs to access essential jobs, didn't fit in with their neighborhood culture, that it was tone deaf to health and economic problems in their communities, and it wasn't addressing real problems of um, traffic violence and speeding on major arterials. Oh, that was long-winded. Oh, um. Okay, so what did we do with all this feedback? So the first thing we tried to do was do no harm. So after hearing concerns about the program from our East Oakland partners, we stopped rolling out new slow streets in um, what we refer to as deep East Oakland and worked with our partners to find responses to COVID that did address their needs. Um, another complaint we heard early on is why are we focusing on this and we should be focusing on COVID testing. as most of you probably know the city is basically completely siloed separate departments. Um, but one thing we did do to try and address this is to use these barricades of like little billboards to share COVID testing and other relevant resource information. And so we'd paste little posters on there with information about um, COVID testing and resources. Um, I like to think of slow streets as always being a yes and program. So when we heard that the program itself wasn't working for everyone in the beginning, specifically those most affected by COVID-19 and shelter in place and already underserved populations, 
We worked with advocates, elected officials, and community members to come up with some new iterations like Slow Streets Essential Places in addition to keeping the existing Slow Streets program. And in collaboration with our Economic and Workforce Development Program, we opened Flex Streets Program to support the business community, which um, uses the same materials, clones and barricades to make space in, on the streets and sidewalks for businesses, for outdoor seating, curbside pickup, whatever they would find helpful. We had one do like a, um, one art center make space for, for art programming. Um, and eventually we began opening new slow streets only in collaboration with community groups that we have a relationship with so they could kind of tell us how it's going and that work um, with underserved populations. So we opened one up in Chinatown around the rec center so that they could use that space for outdoor programming. We worked with a senior walk club out of a senior center to make their walking route a slow street. Um, in one instance, we worked with a council member and implemented a slow street to address traffic and interpersonal issues on that particular street. We also received an arts and culture grant from Smart Growth America, where we worked with a local Oakland artist um, and community advocate. His name is Jonathan Brumfield, and he helped us to create barricades and planner boxes that you can see just are so beautiful and have so much design and and um, life to them and they were meant to be more meaningful and attractive to residents on one of our deep east oakland corridors and this is also in response to complaints that a the barricades just kept getting knocked over or falling over and b that they were ugly so, um, i think that he did a great job making them a lot more lively as well Okay, so moving into phase two and beyond, um, meaning kind of last fall to current day and into the future, talking about long-term projects. So we worked on an interim findings report, which was released last fall to evaluate how the program is and isn't working across the city with a special attention to the realities of Oakland's inequitable distribution of resources and opportunities and the disproportionate effects of COVID on Oakland's Latinx and Black populations. And we really wanted to, to come up with recommendations to stabilize the Slow Streets program for the duration of the pandemic and to inform post-pandemic planning. And to, for this report, we got, we tried to get both qualitative and quantitative data on use of the Slow Streets, traffic, maintenance needs, included feedback um, and a lot of other stuff as well. Okay, so what we heard, um, Slow Streets did um, meet its goal of creating space for physically for physical activity without impeding essential street functions, meaning things like emergency response or, or um, garbage collection. Um, the program received a lot of positive support but that support and use of the slow streets really varied by demographic and geographic group. We also heard that traffic safety is a more important transportation issue um, for many Oaklanders, especially those in high priority neighborhoods. And we learned that cones and barricades are not sustainable materials for implementing partial street closures, meaning that our maintenance crews are out there like every week picking up and replacing all kinds of materials. So our recommendations for phase two and beyond, um, one, evaluate the existing slow street corridors and make context specific changes, uh, which we are already doing. Two, continue the slow streets corridors essential places program through the end of shelter in place. Um, so working on that now. And then channel the enthusiasm for slow streets into equitable and sustainable programs like pop-up slow streets, and neighborhood level traffic calming. And this, we're still in the process of figuring out exactly what that looks like and what that means, how we take lessons learned from this program and extrapolate them into um, our larger planning efforts. So as part of our corridor specific engagement, we began engaging with residents 
by sending um, this piece of mail with surveys to each resident along the corridor for them to either mail back or take the survey online in four different languages and basically ask them if they would like us to remove their slow street or upgrade it and make specific changes. And for this street in particular, Brookdale Ave, we heard a lot about issues at intersections with major streets. Um, and so based on that feedback, we did make specific design adjustments to address that, moving the barricades back a little bit, but putting um, so there wasn't that conflict turning onto the street, but also putting um, advanced warning signage on the major street leading up to the turn. Um, and here's an image of some of those type three barricades that um, we're offering as the upgrade. So they're a little bigger, they're bolted into the ground, so they're a little less likely to walk away. And it also has this slow street specific signage, which I think is good both for clarity and um, just for, for a little bit of branding of the program. And it, and it has some of the images that were made by the artists that we worked with on the Planters Grand, Jonathan Brumfield, that include images of kids playing and a person riding a scraper bike. So what happens post pandemic? Um, honestly, we are still very much in the process of figuring that out. Um, we are currently upgrading our essential places improvements to permanent, many of them with um, to permanent using concrete as part of a COVID relief grant. And we're really working towards installing more improvements of this essential places kind and especially thinking about, I think one of the big lessons learned was, was what an essential places, what essential places are and, and how to prioritize not just based on where people live, but where they go. Um, so we're hoping to do more of those moving forward. Um, we do have some kind of like legal, logistical, traffic and engagement related um, considerations with installing permanent barricades on, slow, on the slow streets currently. But slower streets, the idea of slower streets are super popular and have withstood the test of time. And we do have some ideas percolating regarding creating permanently slowed neighborhood streets and exactly what that design looks like. Um, we're still discussing that now. Um, so firstly, I just wanna acknowledge that we didn't do enough engagement before the program rolled out. And I think that that was, that was something that, that we received backlash for and, and that, was, that was real, we, we should have done that. But I am really proud of how the engagement we have been doing throughout the program has been really instrumental in determining where we're going. Um, and, and new iterations of the program and fostering relationships between the city and some of our high priority communities. Um, I think it's really important to prioritize equity in these fast moving um, implementation projects and COVID-19 responses. I think that when things move super quickly, that's a place that, that equity considerations can get left out. Um, this was really an evolutionary adaptive program where the goal was not let's see how we can bring this to permanence, but let's see how we can adapt this to the community's needs. And I think the quick build tactics and the community engagement tools we use allowed us to pivot to the needs of the community quickly. And I just want to say that Slow Streets isn't a program to designed to reduce inequities in our city the same way something like affordable housing or a business relief program is. Um, and I don't want us to confuse it with that, but I'm also a really strong believer that we should be embedding these values into all of our programs, no matter what they're addressing. Um, yeah, so that's it. Just a big thank you to all of my colleagues and um, folks at other organizations that helped us out. And, and thank you all um, for having me today and, and for being here to listen. And I think I'll take questions at the end. Great, uh, thank you so much, Noelle. And yes, I did, uh, I failed to mention, or maybe I did, um, that we ask everyone to hold their questions and to allow all of our presenters to get through. And then we will uh, circle back and answer any questions that you do have. But please feel free to throw them into the chat if you'd like. Uh, next up is Kate, and I think see she's queued up and ready to go. Hi, 
Okay, just getting ready to share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Um, it was great to see Noelle sitting outside doing her presentation because um, it is snowing here in Milwaukee, our typical, hopefully final April snowstorm. Um, but I'm happy to be here to be presenting on Milwaukee Active Streets. Um, I'm a transportation planner for the city of Milwaukee's Department of Public Works. So I am going to be giving um, for about half of this presentation an overview of our 2020 program. Um, and then I'll talk about how we've changed this program for 2021 and years beyond. Um, so when the pandemic hit um, and we saw um, other cities throughout across the country and um, really globally uh, doing programs similar to um, Noel's in Oakland, um, where people were, where cities were um, limiting or closing streets to traffic to increase space for walking, biking, and being active, um, we began um, having uh, discussions internally for doing that um, in Milwaukee, um, and we were really being pushed by some advocates to, to do this as well. Um, so in the city of Milwaukee, the majority of our parks are, and especially our large parks, are owned and operated by Milwaukee County Parks. Um, so we formed a partnership with them to develop this Active Streets program. Um, and um, again, our goal was to create more space for walking, biking, um, and other activities where people could do these at a safe distance from one another. Um, in March 2020, we saw a huge increase in trail usage. We have trail counters throughout the city. Um, and throughout March, we saw a 40% increase in trail usage. Um, that did decrease over the year, but we still had a 19% increase over 2020. So we began our program in mid-May. Um, we chose four city streets. Um, and we chose these streets based on um, an equitable distrib distribution throughout the city, um, which we did in partnership uh, with the county to make sure that we had active streets locations throughout the city. We also um, based our locations on where we had um, either in design or future plans for bicycle boulevards. Um, so the darker blue lines on the map and numbers one through four are the city locations. Um, number two there, there's two intersecting streets. Uh, those are bicycle boulevards. Currently, they were constructed um, last summer. Um, so while we had the active streets program going, they were actually um, constructed into bicycle boulevards. And then number four on the south side, that is uh, another bicycle boulevard that's in design right now. Um, so the county started out with, um, I think, three locations, number eight, nine, and six. Um, those, they added on number seven and five uh, based on partnerships with other municipalities um, and then ended up taking out number nine uh, based on community feedback. And our program concluded in mid-November. Um, so I'll be focusing on what we did at the city. I will just say the county, because there were no residences along the county streets, mostly because they were on um, within parks, um, they were able to shut down the streets completely. Um, but since our active streets locations were on streets with residences, um, we only we closed them to through traffic. Um, so we had kind of a similar barricade setup to what they had in Oakland. We had two barricades. Um, kind of shutting down half of the street with signs that said roads close to through traffic. And then um, these informational signs, which were also in Spanish on the signs attached to another barricade um, to let people know uh, what active streets is and that you could still drive or park on the street if you're trying to reach a destination there. Um, and we only did these at key intersections. So we didn't have them at every single intersection. Um, we did, I believe, end up adding barricades to every street based on feedback from communities. So kind of similar to what uh, Noel said in Oakland, um, we also didn't really do much community engagement. 
because of the rapid deployment nature of this project. Um, we did send out letters to every address on the complete or on the active streets, um, and we did work with or at least speak with community organ organizations in each of the active streets neighborhoods prior to deployment. Um, and for the most part, uh, they were well received by community members. Um, but we did on our Galena Street active street have some concerns that were raised both by community organizations and the aldermen for the area um, that he had received some feedback from residents that were kind of unsure about this program and how it would work. Um, so that street actually launched quite a bit later, not until August, um, because we did do some community engagement. We held a virtual open house where we addressed residents' concerns and worked with um, some partner organizations there to get the word out about the active street location and what it would mean. Um, and then we held, um, during that, uh, the, our open house meeting, um, we did come to an agreement with all the residents in attendance that it would be worth it to at least try it. Um, the great thing about this program is it's easily modified. We could put the barricades in and then if it turned out that it wasn't working out, they could easily be removed or adjusted. Um, so we did try this out. We launched it with a community walk with the aldermen, um, residents and leaders from community organizations. Um, and it did end up being very well received. Um, we did end up making probably more adjustments to barricades on the street because we did have those stronger relationships with community organizations and residents. And the image on the right is from um, the Washington Street Active Street. This is the street that was on the south side of the city um, where we have a bicycle boulevard project that's in design, um, a community organization 16th Street Community Health Centers is a subconsultant on that project. And um, they really embraced this, this street and they ended up holding a weekly walking club um, once a week for several months where they met up in a park that's in the middle of the street or in the middle of the, I guess the entire, the length of the street. Um, and they held a walking club that would walk the length of the street, walking and biking club. A lot of kids came with bikes. Um, and I, I participated in it once and it was great. They had a, a portable speaker that they brought um, and walking up and down the street. Um, it was a, a great experience. Um, so in terms of figuring out uh, active streets usage, so we uh, utilized volunteer monitors to check on the status of barricades and report back if anything needed to be adjusted or moved. Um, so one of the th questions we asked when people did this monitoring was um, how many people they observed using the active street. Um, so this is definitely not a great measurement because it's really based on sporadic um, observations. And um, we had more monitors on some streets than other streets, uh, but based on anecdotal evidence that we have from community members, this is fairly an accurate representation of the types of usage on the streets. So Fratney Street, which is currently a bike boulevard, it's in the River West neighborhood in Milwaukee. If anyone's familiar with the neighborhood, it's a very big bicycling neighborhood. River West 24 race um, happens there um, every year. So we, it's not a big surprise to us that this was really embraced there and that it was seeing the highest usage. Um, but it is also uh, one of the streets in a mostly white neighborhood. Um, so we did definitely observe some differences in reactions to the street uh, based on racial makeup and other demographics. So we also uh, sent out uh, or did a survey at the end of the program to get feedback. Um, we did this through two different methods. We had just a traditional online link that was sent through our um, e-notify service, which is like an e-newsletter, um, social media, next door, email contacts, et cetera. We also mailed a letter with a link to the survey to all addresses within two blocks of the city's active streets locations. And we had it available in English, Hmong, and Spanish. Um, we had just over a thousand responses, um, 400 about from our mail, which um, doesn't seem too bad, but it's a kind of low response rate. Um, 
And similar to other surveys we've done, even with the mailed survey, we did notice that a lot of our respondents were uh, whiter and wealthier than, than what is representative of the city and the neighborhoods as a whole. Um, one of the questions we asked on the survey was if people supported the continuation of Milwaukee Active Streets. Um, we had overwhelmingly people saying, yes, they think it's a great idea anytime. Um, we did have some people say yes, but with some changes. Um, and a lot of those changes are what we are incorporating uh, this year. Um, if you're interested, you can see all of our uh, survey results on our website, milwaukee.gov slash Active Streets 2021. Um, but some of the lessons learned both from the survey and just from uh, running the program is that barricades and signage aren't a perfect solution to cut down on traffic. Obviously, not everybody pays attention to the fact that they're um, closed, um, except for close to through traffic. Um, People need encouragement to use active streets, particularly outside of the one neighborhood where we already have a lot of people where, who bike and walk. Um, and active streets represent an opportunity for people to think about streets differently and to try out new things that residents want. So starting this year, we're transitioning the program into a community-led initiative. Um, so in February, we released a request for proposals for community-based organizations to propose active streets locations. Um, the community-based organization will receive up to $5,000 to do programming and outreach with an additional $4,999 for arts. Um, and people who work in public sector probably notice the dollar less and might know why. Um, once we get it above 10,000, our contracting gets a little bit more complicated, but I did have some questions from our CBOs as to why, where's that missing dollar? Um, just makes it easier for us. <laughs> um, we're gonna do basically the same thing with barricades and signage. Um, we did use these wave delineators in this picture here. They, uh, Saris um, manufactures them and they lent us some last year, which we used um, as temporary curb extensions on the Washington Street active street. So we will be purchasing enough so that each street has the opportunity to have one intersection with these temporary curb extensions. Our goals for this program are to slow motorists to create space for people to walk, bike and be active, both during the pandemic, but also beyond because we do want this program to be long-term. Um, to build trust with residents by partnering with community organizations, improve health outcomes for residents through increased physical activity, address reckless driving on neighborhood streets, respond quickly to traffic safety concerns using low cost infrastructure and use art to reimagine streets. So for the active streets locations that were eligible for this program, um, they could be up to one and a half miles in length. They need to be primarily residential or low car traffic. Um, and we gave preference to locations meeting at least one of the following criteria um, located in a neighborhood revitalization strategy area, which is a, um, a HUD designated area based on income, um, identified as a planned bicycle boulevard in our bike plan, creating connections to parks or trails, for supporting safe routes to schools efforts. So the organizations, their responsibilities are to monitor barricade signage and infrastructure, promote the active street um, to community members, hold community events along the active streets and provide community feedback to us at DPW. And our responsibilities are to provide ongoing technical assistance limited printing and mailing support. Um, we will also monitor the barricade signage and infrastructure and then adjust as needed or requested by the organization. Um, so I mentioned that we will also be providing funding for arts integration. We're partnering with a local, artist, local, local arts organization called Artists Working in Education or AWE. Um, so each location will have that $4,999 allocated for arts. Um, and AWE will provide them with a menu of options uh, such as painted crosswalks, intersection murals, community flags. 
Um, so we have selected the, the locations for this year's program. We received 10 proposals. Um, since this is a new, totally new program, I was not sure how many to expect. Um, we chose four, which are shown on the map here. Two of them, numbers three and four, are similar um, or the same as ones that were included last year. Um, we had a selection committee made up of myself, a staff member from our Department of City Development who works on community grants, and a staff member from our health department. I held kickoff meetings with all of the organizations last week, and everyone's very excited for this program. Um, our barricades will be deployed in mid-May, and the program will run um, through early to mid-November, depending on weather and feedback from the organizations and residents. Um, and one thing that was interesting here, as you can see, locations number one and two are quite a bit shorter than the other locations. Um, and this was pretty common in most of the proposals I received. Um, a lot of the organizations proposed streets that were much shorter segments. Um, and the two that are longer, like I said, were ones that were part of the program last year. So just interesting, something for me to think about um, for our future programs, um, the length of the street, the shorter seems a little bit more feasible for most organizations to manage. So this is supposed to be a three phase program. So that is phase one, the very temporary, um, barricades and infrastructure. Um, and then phase two is what I'm calling semi-permanent traffic calming. Um, so streets that are go through phase one will be eligible for phase two, which will determine when we evaluate the program in November and December. Um, so if it's a lot, one of the longer streets, it'll be a smaller section. Um, if it's one of the shorter streets, it might be able to be the entire street. Um, so we will hire the community organization again to conduct outreach and propose infrastructure locations and evaluate and collect data. So the semi-permanent infrastructure will consist of things like these rubber speed humps that's in the image there, um, perhaps uh, parking curbs that can be formed into traffic circles um, and other things that can be just bolted in and taken out and moved um, so that if needed, we can try out a couple different configurations and the residents and organizations can let us know what, what works best on the street. Um, and this could stay in place for multiple years, just depending on how it holds up and what residents think of it. Then our third phase would be that we um, at DPW will commit to seeking grants or allocating budget to make those semi-permanent changes permanent. Um, this could be several years after phase two, just depending on funding availability and how that semi-permanent traffic calming infrastructure is holding up. Um, we have used those rubber speed humps in one location in the city, um, but we haven't really done it on a large scale yet. So um, still not totally sure how it will hold up or, or how residents will react to it. Um, so this is just a kind of random slide as I was putting this together. I know sometimes I see presentations like this and think, you know, how could I do this um, in my city? So I just wanted to put some tips together um, for anyone thinking of how could I do this myself? Um, so my first one is just putting together a proposal. So when we did the Active Streets program, in 2020, um, there was a lot of people both in the city, but then some of our external partners too, who had some ideas of um, what this program could transition to. Um, and then I had kind of my own ideas and I was like, you know, I need to put these, my ideas into writing. Um, so at least we have something to build from and so that this program can be um, something that's useful for the community. So I just put together a proposal um, which is essentially what the program is going to be, what I just presented. So um, I gave, I sent that to my boss and said, this is what I think we should do with active streets. So um, let's, let's see if we can make it happen. Um, so if you've got an idea, put it in writing and, and hopefully that can help move it forward. 
Um, and then the other, the next one is using local budget. Um, so we, in my department, or I guess in my unit, the multimodal unit in the Department of Public Works, we're a relatively new unit, um, only formed a few years ago, and only in 2020 was our first year that we actually had our own budget. Um, so we do have some funding to put towards new programs like this, which I know is not the case in every city or every department. Um, but as we were planning for this program, a lot of grants have come up um, to support programs like these. Um, and we decided that uh, we were really intentional about only using our local budget this first year um, because we want this to be a sustainable program that is put into our budget every year um, and not something that is we can only do because we received a grant for it. Um, and then lastly, understand your procurement process. I don't know that I still understand our procurement process, but um, when I first started, when I first started talking to my boss about this idea and hiring community organizations, we weren't sure if this was going to be possible. Um, but as we started talking to our procurement department and um, accountants, uh, we learned that it was a lot more flexible than what we had initially thought. Um, so if you don't have a good understanding of your procurement process and you want to try to be more flexible with it, just start asking questions and maybe it will be better than what you think. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, there's our website if you're interested in learning more. Um, I also have all the application materials on there still. So if you wanted to see our request for proposals um, or anything else like that, it is available there. Um, so thanks so much. Great, thanks so much, Kate. Uh, appreciate you sharing those lessons from the Active Streets in Milwaukee. Um, next up, we have Bet and Sonia from the city of Atlanta. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, can everyone see my presentation? Yes. Okay, and I'm trying to minimize the Zoom. Okay, panel, there we go. All right, awesome. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Beth Malloy and I'm an urban designer with the public space team for the City of Atlanta's Department of City Planning. So I'm not with our Department of Transportation, but we work very closely with them. And I'm here today with my colleague, Sonia Sequera. She's our community engagement manager for the office. And she'll be speaking on, more on our community engagement processes later on in the presentation. But um, thank you so much for having us today. We're really excited to um, share the work that we've done on our placemaking program, as well as our tactical urbanism efforts. Um, the placemaking program is a really important initiative for us. Um, we've invested a great deal of time into developing uh, the standards to test, you know, these various interim solutions that ideally um, enhance our, our public spaces and hopefully set the standard for uh, future permanent solutions. Um, our work, as well as the work that many other cities are doing, requires a ton of communication with neighborhood groups, working with other departments and offices within the city and a lot of um, organizing those uh, little logistical tasks. So again, I'm looking forward to diving into those details with you. And, um, and yeah, so before um, we get started and, and in, before we get started in regards to talking about the specific projects, I wanted to give a little bit of background on why we're doing what we're doing and how we approach our projects. Um, this is the Atlanta city design and it is our guiding document. Uh, it was written into our city's charter in 2017 and it is a concept uh, created through a community led process to outline how Atlanta should design for our future and accommodate for growth. Uh, this, the, it was precipitated um, the creation of this document by a population projection of us tripling in size in the next couple of decades. So um, because we're growing and we're growing rapidly, we thought to ourselves, um, at what point do we decide how we want that growth to be shaped? So this book sort of outlines uh, how we want to move forward as a city. It's not necessarily a plan. It's 
more of a strate strategic realignment of plans, projects, policies, and uh, priorities as well. Uh, we've identified how the city was shaped initially and what defines us as a city, um, and that helps guide us in how we solve problems and take on new challenges. So um, if there are a lot of uh, participants uh, from Chicago today, you might be familiar with this with the plan on this slide, um, Burnham's 1909 plan of Chicago, which uh, still guides the development of Chicago today. Um, it provides an outline that you're always aspiring and, and moving towards it. This plan, uh, it remains relevant more than 100 years later and believes in people and recognizes that mutual relationship between the public realm and the lives of people. And for us, um, to get started, um, we really needed help visualizing what those smaller tasks and projects might add up to and how our core values can work together to build um, a future that we want. So the way that we think about our streets is fundamentally shifting. Uh, as our city grows, the Atlanta city design compels us to design significantly more and improve public space to support the life of our our growing city and to design our streets for people and not just solely for cars. So our public space uh, work can help us reimagine our streets to create spaces that facilitate a, a vibrant public life. This is an image of the Broad Street Boardwalk downtown. It is the only public plaza of its kind in Atlanta and similar to our placemaking program projects and our, our tactical approach. It's an interim solution that we've learned from and are currently working with um, consultants and the and the community on designing a permanent solution for this space. All right, so I've set the stage uh, for us to get into our placemaking and tactical urbanism work more specifically. Uh, our placemaking program provides funding and technical assistance for community projects through a competitive application process. Our placemaking program was established in 2017 and was originally operated out of our Office of, Mobi of Mobility and primarily focused on pedestrian safety at that time. It was later relocated to our Office of Design where the focus on pedestrian safety remains, but is brought into creating uh, exceptional public spaces for our, our residents. Um, we really want our public spaces to be accessible, comfortable, aesthetically pleasing and sociable. And we hope that the interventions um, become a tool for uh, residents and community organizations to lead the changes they want to see in their neighborhoods. Um, these are our awarded projects from 2017 to 2020. In our initial three years, we received 47 applications for interim improvements move forward with 11 of those and have completed nine. Uh, you can see on this map the geographic distribution of projects thus far, which spans several neighborhoods across the city of Atlanta. And you know we want to make sure that um, we are distributing these projects equitably and that our project locations are in areas where enhancements will, will make the most impact. Um, these are the projects we've installed in our initial three years, you can see an array of project types that we've implemented thus far from our earlier projects. Um, you can see examples that have been more towards traffic control and the simplification of intersections. And as our program has evolved, you start to see other project types such as beautification through murals, uh, sidewalk extensions, uh, better bus stops, artistic crosswalks, and parklet installations. So these projects, project examples show the evolution of the program and the evolution of our public realm through uh, rapid deployment projects. And Sonia is going to jump in and explain our, our typical process before I jump into um, some project examples. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll be talking about kind of our greater engagement and citywide work a little bit um, later in the presentation, but specifically for placemaking, um, we're trying to create a process that is more community co-led um, and really bringing them in um, to the beginning of that process. And so typically with a lot of um, public sector and city led work in Atlanta, um, it's that we start off with the idea, um, the city has that, we get feedback from the community and then the design and installation is put in. 
Um, but because these projects are so community specific, um, and if you, you can go to the next slide, um, we're looking at ways that the ideas come from the community. So there's an application process at first um, where we have given them the parameters of what's possible to do with our um, kind of grant funding. And um, then we have a committee from the city that reviews those ideas, looks at their feasibility, if it's something that we can do um, within code laws and any um, legality concerns. Um, and then we go back to the community to hear about what they think about those um, tweaks, any resources that we can put in, any resources that community organizations can also put in. Um, and then finally, to really create this continuous feedback loop. So um, because the projects are rapidly deployed, that also means that we can edit them quickly and we can even move them or change them if needed. And so um, through that continuous feedback process, um, which we do through surveys and community meetings, um, as well as just seeing what people are saying about it in other um, ways that we're not asking for. Um, so on Facebook forums or even on Nextdoor, um, to guide our design and um, create an incremental process where those designs are then being edited however we can um, to be the best fit for the community um, and having them be really bought into the process. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, I'm going to jump into a couple quick project examples. Um, in 2018, we received an application from a neighborhood group in Chosewood Park. Uh, originally, the applicants wanted to use bulb outs to have spaces for community activations, and we worked closely with them to develop a design, and while we were working with them, we learned that um, they're in an uh, area that is highly trafficked by pedestrians uh, trying to, um, or not trying to, uh, successfully accessing this park at the end of the street, and with that information, um, ultimately, we were able to uh, develop a design that supported the needs of the, the, the applicants, the neighborhood community, as well as provide um, safer access to those getting to the park. And we were able to achieve this through the implementation of a curb extension and a sidewalk extension on the side of the street that does not presently have a permanent sidewalk. And so the design um, for this project includes you know, striping, flex posts, uh, wheel stops, and, and planters. Um, and, and we did this to implement traffic control measures, but also to more broadly improve spaces for uh, pedestrians and those in the community. We implemented this project in phases, starting with um, the standard control devices and then upgraded by adding planters. And so this added emphasis on the pedestrian experience in addition to uh, the safety measures is, is key to what we'd like to see in, in projects moving forward. Uh, the next project example that I'll provide is the Parklet and Grant Park. Um, it was relocated from another neighborhood, actually. There were several challenges with the original location, and um, the residents saw it as more of a hindrance to, to parking than a benefit to the community. But since the Parklet has been relocated to Grant Park, it has been successfully adopted by the community and, and adjacent restaurants there. Um, for this location, we distributed online surveys to residents and business owners in the impacted area to get a sense of how people felt about the existing space. We also executed field studies and took observations on the ground to better understand the pedestrian and uh, vehicular movement. And we worked with the applicants to select an on-street, a location which was an on-street parking spot along their commercial corridor. Um, and what I like about both of these project examples is you have this sort of idea of adaptation from both the community and the design team and, um, and how those were necessary. In Chosewood, we helped broaden the community's idea for what they wanted to see in their neighborhood. And in the example of the Grant Park Parklet, we learned that the information surrounding these projects needs to be disseminated a little more broadly. And ideally the recipients of these projects um, are open to how spaces um can change and and overall i would say the reception towards parklets seem seems to have shifted we've noticed that more people are thinking about their streets in different ways and the addition of a uh, community a community space has a, a greater impact than the loss of you know one or two parking spaces um and just quickly i wanted to 
jump into some of the logistics that go into making these projects a, a reality. It's been an immense learning experience and wanted to share a little bit of the behind the scenes uh, work. So here are some images of what our installation processes look like. Our team of designers are always on site helping to facilitate those. And for our artistic installations, um, we support the artists by applying for street closures and getting the necessary traffic controls to keep them safe while they're working. And also we work um, closely with a, a team at Public Works to get these projects striped and we make sure that we're always fostering our relationships across departments. We also have expanded our storage to accommodate the rapidly accumulating number of materials. And these materials are initially delivered to a city warehouse that has a, a loading dock and it's ideal for larger, del larger deliveries. Um, but then later the items are, are distributed to our smaller storage sites. Um, another logistic that we've tackled in, in smoothing out this process is using an organization system, which helps keep track of things like our registered city vendors, our project schedules, cost estimates, and a product catalog with each of the product's respective costs. Um, we've created an inventory catalog with our go-to durable materials that we refer to when we're thinking about the design and the, the budget of each project. Um, so this is sort of where we are now, um, our placemaking parklets um, for 2021. Um, one advantage of this rapid deployment project is that it lets us address the, the current need during the pandemic. So um, in 2021, um, we along, or sorry, 2020, we along with many others transitioned to work from home and during that transitional period, we adapted our placemaking program to respond to the impact that COVID was having on some of our local businesses. So we received funding that enabled us to institute an additional placemaking round that focuses on uh, pandemic relief and is intended to support outdoor dining for restaurants that do not currently have that capacity. Um, for our pandemic related projects, we're offering assistance with a three phase parklet implementation. And so the point is to try it out and see if it works and ideally formalize it and make it a more permanent condition in the future. Um, we've received 25 applications for parklets and have publicly awarded 11 of those. Of those 11, um, these locations have been installed with our first phase of demo parklet. And these demo parklets include a ramp for ADA access and um, water-filled jersey barriers to surround the parklet space. The second phase, we will work to construct a basic parklet with a platform that is flush with the sidewalk, and they will include more substantial traffic control elements to get us into full compliance with our uh, Department of Transportation standards. So currently, the outdoor dining legislation is set to expire at the end of 2021, but this legislation could be extended if the parklet constructions are successful are a successful intervention. And <clears throat> if it is successful, we would love for the parklets to become permanent. And our hope is that future rounds of the placemaking program, we could upgrade the parklets further with planters and fence panels as the protective barriers. And how we like to think of these projects is about how they all connect together and how um, these are small tactical projects, but collectively make a, a significant change in our public realm. Um, and lastly, um, for, for me, lastly, before I pass it off to Sonia, to keep um, all of this work clear for both us and others, we've put together a tactical urbanism guide, and it outlines various standards that we've established in collaboration with our Department of Transportation. And this guide um, can be used as a toolkit for neighborhoods and applicants as a way to better understand their projects and its potential, their project and its potential outcome. And they can use this standardized guide to identify the changes they want to implement themselves. Um, additionally, it ideally increases efficiency and facilitates a smoother permitting process um, because it provides templates and standards that have already been approved by ATLDOT. So this is what the cover of our um, tactical urbanism guide looks like. This version of the guide primarily focuses on 
residential streets and neighborhood commercial nodes, which generally have lower vehicle speeds and volumes that require less traffic data and engineering to ensure safety and to coordinate traffic operations, making them sort of ideal for community-led interventions, and which is an important step towards empowering those communities and uh, to implement the change that they want to see in their neighborhoods. So um, with that, I'm going to um, pass it over to Sonia to talk about our engagement and wanted to say thanks again, everyone. Um, so hi everyone again. Um, so I'm the community engagement manager within our office of design and um, our hope through all of the all of our projects is we have engagement at the neighborhood level, um, like we've done with the placemaking programs, um, but then to also connect this to this larger conversation of um, how are our streets designed, who are they designed for, um, who feels safe in them, um, who feels welcome in them. Um, and what opportunities do we provide residents of Atlanta um, to really engage in this larger conversation and see how, um, as Beth mentioned, all of the kind of smaller tactical projects can fit together um, in a really impactful way for our public realm. Um, and so the first way that we do that is through the Atlanta City Studio, which is a pop-up urban design studio within um, the City of Atlanta's Department of City Planning. And we have a storefront that moves locations every one to two years, usually in areas of Atlanta that are rapidly developing um, so that people in that neighborhood and beyond can um, come in in a really welcoming, accessible way, see our work, get to talk to a designer that's on duty for um, those hours, um, completely open to the public and have it be a little bit less intimidating than sometimes um, your average city hall. Um, and so currently we're located in downtown Atlanta. Um, next slide, please. And um, that is in South downtown in an area of town that is um, rapidly changing, um, has had a lot of developers come through, um, but is on the precipice of that change. And it's also in between two very um, high traffic MARTA stations um, and really the center of the city. So this is a great spot for us to be in for, um, to be a little bit more accessible to the public since anyone can access us to, through MARTA. Um, and then also to be in an area of town that is experiencing a lot of change. And so our engagement activities look um, a little bit different right now because of the pandemic. But prior to that, we would do a lot of design thinking exercises within our studio. Um, and really have it be somewhere where the public can come in and have these open conversations, um, engage with the work a little bit differently, um, maybe in ways that they hadn't before, um, of rather than kind of the dots and stickers that we always have, even though we do have some post-it notes in that left-hand corner, um, having some of the ideas come directly from the communities that we're in, um, encouraging them to get out a red permanent marker and write all over something um, and really open up things that way so that people are more encouraged to participate. So during the pandemic, this has looked a little differently. And while we've done virtual sessions, we also just try to get out where any of our projects are um, and have some of those engagements, um, as well as um, do things like conferences like these so that more people can find out about our work. Uh, next slide. And so we also wanted to highlight um, some of the projects that look at um, the next level of rapid deployment um, and the engagement around them. And the public space that uh, Beth mentioned, the Broad Street Boardwalk is one of those. Uh, it started off with the idea of being very tactical, paint on the street. And then um, the mayor at the time wanted to do something that was a little bit more permanent. And so now we finished this first phase of it um, and it's now under construction. And so during that, we realized that that is another opportunity for engagement. Next slide. Uh, Beth, can you advance the slide? Thanks. Oh, sorry. Is there a delay? Probably. It's okay. Um, and so um, we um, took this opportunity to highlight emerging Black artists in the area. Um, and so rather than the concrete fences, it's inviting people to see how this public space, even during a time of construction, um, can really be part of more something a little bit more engaging um, and a vibrant part of the public realm. Next slide. 
And um, then we also have our Peachtree Shared Space demonstration. And so while during the pandemic, we didn't have um, the kind of open streets that other cities have had, um, we've been looking for the last few years at how our main street throughout Atlanta um, could be more inviting to people outside of cars, um, but coexist with them. And so we're looking at how we could implement a shared space. And um, we're doing that in phases so that people can react to the different elements with it. So it can um, showcase the testing elements of it and we can change things as, um, as needed, um, similar to our placemaking program. And another key part of it is to involve the downtown community and some of the community that is engaged with Atlanta City Studio in the process of it. So when the demonstration project goes in, in June, um, community members can come and then make it their own, help paint um, and have some activations around the area. Um, so it's really showcasing what the street can be in the future. And then finally, um, we want all of these projects to connect back to that larger conversation that I mentioned. And the pandemic has allowed for virtual engagement that allows you to reach more people. And so we had a five week long um, book club on the color of law that I think would have been a little bit more difficult to do in person with the number of people that we had registered and to have that consistency of recordings and um, a week to week basis and chapter guides for it. And so it was facilitated by our department as well as other partners and people throughout um, the city of Atlanta government. And we had 218 people who are part of the book club and 30% ended up not being from Georgia. And we use this um, to have an honest conversation about race in our city um, and then have it also connect back to our projects and the ways that we can better look at equity through them. Um, so to take the research that is in the color of law, um, critique it, understand it, and then um, look at how it can apply to our projects. And with that, I think that is the end of our uh, presentation. Thanks again for having us. Thank you so much, Bet and Sonia. I appreciate that. Um, all right, and our last speaker today is Johannes from Washington, D.C. and uh, DDOT, the District Department of Transportation. Johannes? All right, uh, my presentation coming through. Indeed, it did. All right, great. Uh, sorry that my lighting might not be great. And if you're trying to look at my face, I'm uh, working out of a basement, so it's kind of dark down here. Uh, no outdoor uh, working for me today. It's it's uh, not snowing, but uh, weather's not great here uh, out in uh, greater DC. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Johannes Benhoff. I'm a transportation management specialist fancy title for transportation planner here at the District Department of Transportation, also known as DDOT. Uh, I am on the bus priority team. Um, I also work on coordination with uh, WMATA, which is our regional uh, transportation provider. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our bus priority program and uh, some of the rapid implementation projects that uh, we've worked on in the last couple of years. Uh, so first of all, I'll talk a little bit about the bus priority program. So this is a relatively new program for us. Uh, really started kind of fledgling in uh, 2019. Uh, the vision uh, for the uh, program is to provide faster and more reliable transit. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, kind of coincided right with the program starting up. So the first couple of projects that we focused on were really this uh, rapid implementation. How could we make bus service better um, as part of the response to and recovery from um, COVID-19? So uh, one of the statistics that we noticed uh, as we um, kind of adapted and started functioning um, after the initial uh, first couple of weeks of lockdown uh, that most of the Metro Rail ridership really didn't come back. We're still sitting at 10% of what we were, were at uh, average before the pandemic, but uh, our bus ridership was consistently, you know, 40 to 70%, depending on which line. 
um, we were looking at. So we knew that we had to make um, some changes to try to improve uh, the bus ridership um, in the short term while we were rolling out the larger program. Um, some of the kind of statistics here, most of our bus ridership um, is lower than um, 30,000 uh, 30, per year, which is substantially below um, area medium income for DC. And um, this program wasn't just uh, about putting bus lanes down, it was about looking at the entire rider experience and how we could improve uh, bus ridership. So that's looking at how people are getting to, to and from bus stops. Um, it's about um, bus lanes and reducing um, congestion and delays for buses. And it's also about um, using other tools that may not be as um, really visible, uh, such as transit, transit signal priority or queue jumps um, to address problems. Uh, you can see here that uh, we've started to work on uh, the bus priority network throughout the city. Uh, the red here highlighting where we have existing lanes already, um, lots of short segments. Uh, we're hoping that um, the by identifying um, a, the network and the plan, uh, we can more uh, readily integrate um, uh, a network rather than having uh, just these like short segments where we've kind of identified the, the highest um, delay or the best opportunity for us to put in uh, some, of, some of the initial infrastructure. All right, uh, so I'll move on to the uh, rapid deployment projects. I'm gonna go over kind of three different uh, types we've, did, we've done. Um, we'll start with uh, ones that were implemented the quickest, um, um, and then we'll get the ones that kind of took the longest, but still kind of are in that more tactical um, slash rapid deployment. So the first project, and this is really kind of the project that kicked off uh, bus priority as a side project to an actual um, real robust team within DDOT, and that's the h &I bus lane pilot. Uh, so this pilot actually went in um, and started the week I started at DDOT. So this is the very first project that I got out on uh, uh, to work on. So uh, this project um, was designed to help uh, improve bus travel speeds through our downtown segment. Um, this uh, area represents more at the at the time represented uh, about 20% of all Metro bus riders in the district pass through um, this area. So it was um, an area that um, we definitely wanted to take um, an opportunity to improve rider, uh, the rider experience and improve bus speeds. So you can see here, uh, this is roughly kind of the area that the um, lanes cover. And these are uh, two one-way streets for those that are not familiar with uh, DC or DC area. So I Street is one way in uh, the westbound direction and H Street one way in the eastbound direction. A White House here for uh, reference if people are kind of thinking about what DC looks like. Uh, so this pilot operated uh, from June uh, through the end of September in 2019. Uh, we uh, did quite a bit of um, data analysis, both quantitative and qualitative to try to figure out all right, uh, did we actually have an impact on bus speeds? Um, were we able to uh, prevent um, any um, you know, uh, negative side effects that would have been showstoppers, such as uh, creating a more dangerous safety um, hazard or some other problem that was unforeseen when we uh, came up with the concept and design? Uh, we didn't find any of those. Uh, we found some parts uh, of the plan that didn't work as effectively as we thought, um, some parts that uh, the community uh, wasn't as happy with as we thought they were going to be based on our initial input um, and, and part of the design process. So we made changes and um, the mayor's office decided to go ahead and make this a permanent um, project in November of 2019. Uh, and that's the time when we also implemented some of those initial changes. So uh, we changed uh, the time of day that the lanes were active. 
um, and we made some signal timing and some turn restrictions, um, as well as a few other minor adjustments that we could make uh, without doing a wholesale um, redesign of the, the street. Um, that wholesale redesign of the street is actually happening right now. So we um, took that initial kind of 1.0 version and we've reiterated into uh, version 2.0 and that uh, construction project is going to start here in the next couple of weeks. Um, and that's really um, taking a real deep dive into uh, the changes in uh, curbside access needs, um, changes to uh, material um, lane width adjustments, uh, improving uh, pedestrian safety, bus rider access, and um, general uh, traffic uh, improvements um, throughout the corridor. All right, uh, the next kind of program that we uh, kind of launched off here was the Car Free Lanes Initiative, and this was part of the pandemic response in 2020. So we had three corridors that were identified, uh, 7th Street, Northwest, which is uh, uh, crosses north to south um, through our, our downtown area, uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. Um, this uh, area is in the Ward 8, which is the East of the River in uh, Washington, D.C., um, and the M Street Southeast, which is um, in the Navy Yard um, neighborhood, which is a very like rapidly developing uh, neighborhood. You can see a picture here. Um, many of these uh, large buildings didn't exist a decade ago, and um, there's a substantial change in population in this neighborhood um, in the last couple of years. So we kind of identified these three areas as places where we could do this tactical rapid implementation within six months. Um, and we were mostly successful. 7th Street, um, kind of right at the at the 11th hour, hit a snag, and we had to put put a pause on that to kind of reevaluate uh, what exactly the plan is looking like. So we're taking a deeper dive, and that kind of went from a tactical to a little bit more traditional uh, planning route to to finish up 7th Street. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Ave uh, got implemented. Um, and it is a peak hour, peak direction bus lane currently. And we're working on, again, that 2.0 version. So uh, something that we think is working very well in the program so far is that like we get these tactical projects or these like quick build projects down. And then we're able to um, go back and actually reevaluate what a better version of this project would look like rather than just letting it sit there and not doing anything with it. Because um, that's one thing we really wanted to avoid was just putting something down and then forgetting about it or not revisiting it and then it deteriorating or not actually meeting um, the needs of the community beyond just that, you know, initial like putting it out there. Um, and then we're also were able to implement the uh, M Street Southeast bus lanes. So these were uh, peak hour bus lanes uh, curbside and uh, they serve both our local DC circulator buses and the regional uh, WMATA bus service. And in our bus lanes, uh, bikes and other uh, bike-like devices are uh, allowed. So um, it kind of um, the branding for 2020 was car-free lanes uh, from the mayor's office to emphasize that this wasn't just for buses, um, but you could also have a little bit more uh, space for riding your bike or your scooter or um, other other device at that same time. Um, and then kind of the, the last project I wanted to highlight here is the 14th Street Traffic Decongestion and Bus Improvement Project. Uh, our comms team really likes mouthful um, names for our projects. So this is uh, one of those names by committee. Uh, but basically this project is uh, one that was took a a little bit longer than these uh, the rapid projects. This is actually um, about a year and a half, which is still very fast for our uh, bus lane projects. The um, only other uh, real big bus lane project that we're working on um, is just going to construction after six years of planning. So, for so to get something uh, on on the street um, in eighteen months to or less is uh, pretty pretty rapid for us. So, um, but. 
what we're looking here for uh, 14th Street was to try to figure out a way um, to get a bike and bus lane to function um, a little bit more smoothly when we had constrained right away, but still high bicycle ridership. Most of our other bus lanes, it's it's really a, a lower bike ridership corridors. So it's um, a place that's a little bit safer for bicyclists that don't want to ride in general traffic, but is not really designed for like high capacity, exclusive, uh, protected bike lane type facility. So this is how do we kind of mix those two in an area where we, we cannot um, have both facilities separated. So um, kind of see some stats here from what 14th Street um, Kind of the, the demographics there. Um, but so we used a couple of tools um, out of our, our priority toolkit. Um, we looked at um, stop rebalancing. So we moved, uh, moved a couple stops uh, to uh, locations so that the stops weren't as close together through this corridor, um, try to speed up um, some of the, the bus service, um, and then also allow us to design um, the bus passing lanes. So at the bus stops, um, it's actually a wider lane for cyclists to be able to pass the bus if, um, if you know they're they're cruising down through the through the corridor and they don't want to necessarily like sit behind the bus as it's servicing the stop. Um, we also have uh, some areas with this uh, protective um, uh, flex posts and wheel stops uh, to try to give it a feel of a, of a little bit more um, protection there. And then um, we're using the this uh, red um, bus paint, um, which is you know, uh, something that is um, not required, but we found it is uh, much better um, to let people know that this is a bus lane. Um, oftentimes the markings kind of get ignored, but that, that red paint is much harder to ignore. Um, so, some, some of the issues that uh, we've had here and we're learning about is that what we think is a, a good idea um, uh, when we're going through the planning stage turns out in reality um, without robust enforcement is it's very hard to um, make sure the drivers are doing what we want them to do and what is legal. Uh, and especially during the pandemic, I don't know how other people's cities have uh, been affected, but um, drivers uh, now with no congestion really feel like, uh, you know, they're off kind of doing whatever they want to do. And um, it's, it's creating a lot of challenges for us to be able to um, use the design as it was intended. So we're, we're making changes um, and kind of reiterating as quickly as possible to try to make the design work with the fewest amount of changes, um, as well as also um, working on better ways to um, use our um, enforcement uh, resources in a way that best complements being able to um, get as many people through safely in, in the areas where we've implemented these projects. And I'm going to make my presentation the shortest because I really like questions more than me just talking. So uh, that's it for me. Thanks so much, Johannes. Um, appreciate that. I think. Um, you know, general timing, we, we do have some time for some questions if folks from the audience have them and would like to ask. Um, our panelists do have a little bit of time available. And uh, I think between Jason and myself, we also have a few that we can throw out to the panelists if, if there's none from the audience. Okay, well, I'm gonna start. Um, Johannes, you were just uh, speaking, so a couple questions for you. Um, I think you were maybe just starting to get to this at the end. On the bus priority streets, you know, how are you balancing those with your bicycle network? Do you have a different priority 
network for bicycles or is it on these kind of some of these key corridors that you're looking at like 14th street that you're looking at integrating the two together yeah, uh, so we are generally going on the philosophy that um, unless it's got um, just an immense right away, which not a lot of our streets do, uh, that we're trying to prioritize uh, buses and cyclists on separate routes so that way we can give them the best infrastructure possible. Um, I think that we've found that mixing the two really only works if one mode is uh, very much more dominant over the other, right? So if it's a it's a very high um, bus corridor and low bikes, they can work together. If it's it's high bikes and low bus, they can work together. But like if they're both very high capacity, it just it, it doesn't really function as well as we'd want it to. And rather than have kind of mediocre results for both, we're trying to really like get the best results for both uh, methods. Yeah, I think what we've seen in uh, discussions with various DOTs is that while there's a desire to implement complete streets, that doesn't mean that every street is complete. It's the, you know, the network that you have yeah. to prioritize. Um, I had one follow-up question related to that. Um, on 14th Street, where you're having the bike lanes pass behind the bus stops, are those bike lanes, do they stay at street level or do they rise to the curb level and kind of in at the table and have a table for pedestrians? Uh, yeah, so these actually, these actually go on the outside of the, the bus stop. So this isn't the like where a, where a bike lane would go through. So we have that as like separate other projects, but we're- They're in, behind though, right? Yeah, so this is on the outside of the bus. So this would be uh, to be able to go around. So if you're behind the bus, you're going to go around to the left side of the bus to go around. And that's all, everything's at street level. Um, and it's, it's marked with the kind of the, the hazard dashing um, okay. to be able to go around. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, any questions from anybody else? I have a question. Yes, Allison. Um, this one is for our uh, planners in Atlanta, when you're talking about the process and reaching out to the community, starting with ideas, um, how did you start that conversation? Um, like, did you give them examples to think about maybe with your guidebook? Um, but yeah, if you could just speak more to that. Thanks. Yeah, so we have a placemaking program guide um, that in the future will be um, kind of woven into the tactical urbanism guide. Um, so part of the goal with the Tactical Urbanism Guide is that um, communities that want to apply um, but either don't get funded or um, their project is ineligible, that they can look into um, being able to implement it on their own. Um, but both of those resources help kind of set the parameters um, for what's possible under this program. And something that we're hoping to do in the future um, is set up more partnerships and resources um, for local grants that are outside of the city that can help communities to implement tactical urbanism. Um, because we also recognize that there's going to be a gap between some of the projects that are chosen and eligible, um, but there's also ones that they may be interested in doing on their own regardless, um, but may not have the funding to do so. Thank you. Um, all right, I have one that's really, I'm gonna say it's for both Noel and Kate. Um, I noticed there was a you know similarity with your programs that they both started out as agency led and then pivoted to community led. I'm just curious to know if this is, um, you know, how vocal your communities have been and if, um, what their history of participation has been in, in transportation projects. And, you know, also curious to see if that's really varying between like Oakland and Milwaukee and if you could speak to that. Sure, yeah, I can, I can take that first. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of our communities were super, super engaged. Um, and like I said, the responses were pretty different. Um, we just got a lot, a lot of people had a lot to say about the program 
and levels of um, engagement were, were different depending on on the area. And in some places, we had a much harder time trying to engage with folks, whereas um, for some of the other slow street corridors, um, we're kind of trying to taper the amount of time we put into just responding to so many requests. So it definitely varied a lot. And we're, we're this is something we've, we've been thinking about and, and trying to work on how to prioritize our time um, in an equitable way at, at the same time wanting to just like encourage the the community engagement that we have been getting and and keep people engaged um and so yeah just just a lot of a lot of folks definitely reached out to talk to us and then in areas where we had a harder time reaching people we, that's when we were trying to leverage some of our partnerships with community-based organizations in some of those neighborhoods like dp soakland and chinatown where we weren't having as much um, communication or we weren't hearing as much feedback and using those organizations to kind of push out the message and, and ask for feedback there. Yeah, and I'd say our um, DPW history of engaging with community members um, on transportation projects has not been great, um, particularly on some of our larger uh, federally funded projects, um, we have not historically done a great job of, of figuring out how to engage with community members, especially because, you know, we have those types of projects require, you know, specific types of participation. So sending letters to the people who live on the corridor, asking them to come to a meeting where there's a couple of poster boards has been just fine for the requirements of those types of grants. Um, so that has led us to just not really being very creative in how we try to engage with community members. Um, so I'd say, you know, similar, similar to uh, Noel, we knew that there were other community groups doing a better job of engaging uh, with residents in their neighborhoods. So um, that's kind of why we transitioned to this because we know that they've got a, a better connection um, and there's definitely some um, a barrier between us staff at DPW and residents. And I, and I think also for us kind of this pivot to trying to put more of the work onto some of these community groups, neighborhood groups, community-based organizations was recognizing kind of um, both the inequitable use of slow streets, but also um, just that certain um, groups were so excited and, and really had the resources to um, put some time into, um, you know, helping plan and, and implement and, and keep them, um, keep them running. And, and that's great. And so I think we were kind of like, our hope was like, yes, if you have, um, if you're super excited about this, we don't want to say no. We also want to prioritize our own time and our resources um, in, a, in an equitable way. So how can we empower you to, to really like take the reins of this project? And I, and I think that's kind of like a, a precursor or watered down version of, of Kate's program where they're, they're really like having it completely owned and led by those, those, um, applicants in those groups. Great, thank you guys so much. From the audience. I was gonna, gonna ask um, any of the interagency projects here, um, what was the process like kind of working with other government agencies outside of your own and then did, were a lot of these projects um, like staff level moving up to like directors and coordination there, or did this kind of filter down from the top? And how did you manage um, these complex projects between a bunch of different bureaucracies? Experience with that. Um, I can speak to our experience working with uh, our county parks department. Um, it was interesting starting out, you know, we were really, um, we had a couple streets picked out, we knew what streets we wanted to do, and then it seemed like the county was taking longer to get their approvals. Um, 
you know, starting, we did work at the staff level and then of course it had to move up to the um, county executive um, eventually, but uh, and then it kind of switched and they were ready to go before we were ready to go. And now I'm not even remembering what the holdup was then because it was so long ago, it seems, but, um, but yeah, there were holdups on both our ends. Um, but then once we got things going, it was pretty simple because we weren't, other than a lot of communications and kind of doing press around the same time, at least for our projects, it, there wasn't a lot of coordination needed. Um, I would say now that we're kind of switching, they, the county parks is doing active streets again, but in fewer locations. Um, and we're still coordinating um, a little bit, but not as much as we did last year since we're going in a very different direction with ours. Um, and uh, so that's been interesting, just kind of navigating that change where we were a partnership before and now or we're kind of wondering, are we still branding things the same way? Should we still be doing press together? Um, and we haven't really resolved those, those questions yet. Yeah, um, for us, I think it's, it, it's interesting. It kind of took the COVID-19 emergency, state of emergency order and, and having our whole city kind of need to come together around that to have really consistent and um, communication between different departments. And so for a while, a lot of our um, kind of like management level staff was going to this weekly meeting with um, heads from a, a bunch of other departments and, and Slow Streets was one of the topics that was brought up in addition to a whole bunch of other things. Um, and I think that did really uh, kind of trickle down throughout the department. And so I feel like just also like with Flex Streets, we worked with um, the, the business department and I feel like just kind of a, a bizarre silver, silver lining of, of needing to respond to such a immense emergency has been this um, like increased amount of communication and, and a, a little, a little less siloing of our departments, um, and I, and I really hope that we're able to keep that communication going because, because that was what was really essential for us implementing things quickly. Because often we have to like wait to get approval from this department, or then need to ask about something else. And having these like regular coordination meetings was, I think, really, really helpful for implementing some of our projects quickly. Yeah, I'll just briefly echo what Noelle was saying of having the consistent coordination meetings. We, most of our work is done um, within just City of Atlanta. So we work cross-departmentally with our um, Department of Transportation. Um, and, and I think initially, at first it was hard to, uh, we hadn't done parklets in the City of Atlanta before. And so it was hard, sort of hard to conceptualize of these different types of designs that could potentially, um, in the eyes of our Department of Transportation's eyes, be unsafe for pedestrians. So um, we that's why we work to build sort of these standards with our Department of Transportation. And we met with, started meeting with them weekly to go over um, different types of designs and get those sort of standards approved so that when applicants apply or we want to install one of these projects, they, uh, the permitting process goes a lot smoother. We, do, we did have two applicants in our placemaking um, pandemic round this year uh, that were on Georgia Department of Transportation routes. And um, we're currently, so we haven't implemented the demo parklet for those locations yet because um, we're still working on coordinating with GDOT. Um, but I, those will move forward eventually. It's just a slower process than the other roads that are directly under our control. And um, I'm not, um, that, yeah, so basically uh, it, it just takes a lot of, of coordination and, and having those, those scheduled meetings to make sure everyone's on the same page. That's how, it, how it's worked out for us. Yeah, for us, uh, we luckily are also kind of our own state, um, so uh, that hasn't been too much of an issue uh, with that level of coordination, but um, it, I think our biggest success has been working with uh, the other agencies that do traffic or parking enforcement. 
because it's not all under our um, agency. So that's been interesting. Uh, we're, we're looking at ways of uh, implementing more automated enforcement to try to like deconflict the actual like people on the ground have to have that interpersonal um, interaction that can be tense and lead to a lot of unfortunate events in a lot of parts of the country, including DC. So ways that we can, you know, use enforcement as a, as a, as a tool in our toolkit, but try to like mitigate the negative effects that go along with it, I think has been something that like, we've been able to do, like, get on that path to doing it better. And I think that's kind of like success that we got coming out of this last year. The audience. I think we are good. If there are no questions, we can close it out. Well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you to all our attendees for spending your afternoon with us um, here. And most importantly, thank you so much to Noel, Kate, uh, Bet, Sonia, and Johannes for sharing your time and your expertise. I know it took a bit to get this coordinated and uh, we always love in-person events, but one of the great benefits of the lockdown is that we're able to do virtual events and extend our um, information gathering across the country. So really happy to have had you here with us and appreciate you sharing your lessons learned with um, the Chicago region and uh, allowing us to hopefully implement some of these solutions uh, here locally. So thank you all so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.